this computer. Welcome on behalf of the International Peace Bureau and the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security. My name is Joseph Gerson, and with me in arranging this interview is Reiner Braun of the International Peace Bureau based in Berlin. We're also joined by several of the IPB staff as well. 60 years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, Russia is employing uh, the strategy of nuclear blackmail and extortion, long practiced by, uh, by US presidents. Vladimir Putin has again brought the world to the brink of a nuclear crisis. Warning that we face a nuclear apocalypse, President Biden has signaled his willingness to respond in kind, with the two threats again bringing us eyeball to eyeball with the annihilation of nearly all human life and much more. We've asked Noam to help us to understand the similarities and the differences between the current moment and the Cuban Missile Crisis, which Noam once described as one of the greatest moments of madness in human history. Uh, we've also asked him to share his thinking uh, about ways that the crisis can be de-escalated and the Ukraine war ended. Uh, Noam Chomsky is a figure who needs no introduction and giving him a proper introduction would take most of the time he has agreed to be with us today. In short, Noam has long been one of the most influential public intellectuals in the world and among the most quoted and cited scholars. Internationally, he was first known and celebrated for his revolutions in linguistics. Since the Vietnam War, he has been an outstanding and heavily relied upon political and social critic. Some of us first met him in his books, American Power and the New Mandarins, in which, which included among others, his essay on the responsibility of intellectuals and his book at war with Asia. He is Institute Professor Emeritus at MIT, and he is now associated with the University of Arizona. He has written more than 100 books, his most recent being Requiem for the American Dream, The 10 Principles of Concentration of Wealth and Power. Noam, thank you very much for joining us. And let me begin with the first question. Repeating myself, you have described the Cuban Missile Crisis as one of the greatest moments of madness in human history. How would you compare the current moment uh, and uh, with, with the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, and Biden's uh, invocation of possible apocalypse? It's not anywhere near the level of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but could move there and start making small steps on the escalation ladder, and it's easy to think of scenarios that go very fast to omnicide. Uh, the most important comparison, I think, is the major issue about a crisis. The major issue about a crisis is not how to get out of it, but how not to get into it in the first place. And that uh, is a crucial feature of the Cuban Missile Crisis and the current semi-crisis. So if you look back at the Cuban Missile Crisis, there were easy ways to avoid it. Uh, they weren't taken and it's worth thinking about them. So why did uh, Khrushchev make the reckless move of putting missiles in uh, a domain that the U.S. Uh, insists on controlling for like 200 years, in fact. Uh, well, there were two major reasons. One was that the United States was carrying out a murderous terrorist war against Cuba with plans that might lead to an uprising and an invasion. So partly it was defense against the uh, major terrorist assault that might lead to another invasion. There was another reason. When Khrushchev came into office, he recognized that Russia was a relatively poor country, could not compete with the United States, uh, and its only hope for social and economic development, which he intended, was essentially a sharp reduction in military confrontation. The United States, of course, is far more powerful and wealthy. So he offered President Kennedy 
a, uh, an agreement in which there would be a sharp reduction in offensive military weapons, mutual reduction. And in fact, he began to carry it out unilaterally. Kennedy administration considered it and reacted with the greatest peacetime military buildup in American history, even though they knew the US was far ahead. Khrushchev's uh, move in Cuba was a reckless move to try to slightly right the military balance. There was a third element related to this, the missile, the Turkish missiles. The United States had Jupiter missiles in Turkey. Kennedy didn't even know it. He had to be informed by Secretary of Defense McNamara. But the, uh, and uh, there was an easy way from the, even before the crisis broke out to end a mutual agreement for the United States to remove the missiles in Turkey and Russia to refrain from sending missiles to Cuba. Uh, this was very easy. The missiles in Turkey were basically useless. In fact, they were being with, going to be withdrawn because they were being replaced by uh, invulnerable polar submarines far more fire, firepower and undetectable, unlike the missiles in Turkey, which could be destroyed in a moment because their locations were known. Well, that was, in fact, that was the final solution after the world came close, very close to annihilation. But it, Kennedy insisted that the agreement be made in secret. So it would be, the principle would be maintained that we have a right to surround them with lethal missiles, but they don't have a right to do anything. That principle has to be maintained. So that's how the world came ominously close, ominously to total disaster. Could have been stopped right at the beginning, first, by calling off the terrorist war, second, by accepting a mutual reduction of armaments, though again, the US was far ahead. Uh, third, by publicly removing the obsolete missiles in Turkey that were being replaced by much more lethal ones. Those paths weren't taken and we almost came to disaster. Well, let's come to uh, let's come to Ukraine. If you take a look, if you look at the Russian statements, Putin statements, uh, what they are is essentially reiteration of the policies of every nuclear weapon state. Every nuclear weapon state has the policy that if they are under existential threat of destruction they may resort to nuclear weapons. Now it's a little different in the Ukraine case because Putin has extended this to the territories that he very recently uh, formally annexed. But other than that, it's the normal statement of every uh, power, except incidentally for the United States, although this is not discussed here, the US has a much more extreme policy it's formulated during the Clinton years in an important STRATCOM strategic command document, uh, Essentials of Post-Cold War Deterrence, 1995, which everyone should read. It's a very striking document. It says the United States must keep a first use policy, even against non-nuclear states, and must constantly be brandishing nuclear weapons because they cast a shadow over other conflicts. If others know that we have them, they're going to keep away when we just invade. So it tells it's a warning to others. Furthermore, it goes on, the United States must project 
a, I'm quoting now, a national persona of being rational and vindictive with some elements out of control so that others will be properly terrified and our nuclear weapons, which we're waving at them, will warn them to keep away. And that's the most extreme policy that's been announced by any nuclear state. It's never discussed here, of course, uh, nor do we discuss Clinton's doctrine, which was explicit that the United States has the right to engage in military force to protect their interests and resources multilaterally if we can, unilaterally if we must. That's us, okay. Uh, going back to Ukraine, is there a way to, uh, the real issue in Ukraine, in my view, is not the likelihood of nuclear weapons. It's the likelihood that Putin might turn to conventional weapons, which he has, which can be used to devastate Ukraine. Ukrainian military command is perfectly aware of this, has even pointed it out. Uh, the United States command, of course, is aware of it. And in fact, is rather puzzled, has been puzzled, that, the, that Putin has not pursued the US-British style of war, which is to go for the jugular. You attack a country, even in a minor attack like Serbia, you immediately go after the communication system, the uh, energy system, uh, uh, transportation, uh, anything that allows the society to function. US, British military uh, officials have been puzzled that Russia didn't do that. That's what they anticipated. Uh, he still could. In fact, yesterday signaled the possibility of doing it. Well, do we want to start that ladder? Well, there are two options. One is to keep to what is, our, in fact, their official policy, continue the war so as to severely weaken Russia and just hope, gamble, that if Russia is pushed to the limit, uh, facing defeat, uh, Putin will quietly pack his bags, uh, slink away in defeat, and go to oblivion or worse, and won't use the weapons that everyone knows he has, which could devastate Ukraine and move up the escalation ladder. That's our policy. We can keep to that. The alternative is to do what most of the world wants, all effectively all of the global south, even large parts of Europe, uh, three quarters of Germans, for example, Slovaks, others, move towards negotiations, diplomatic settlement, uh, try to end the horrors now before they get even worse. Those are the two options. The diplomatic option recedes the longer the war continues. It's uh, part of the dynamics of war is that each side becomes more extreme, uh, more furious with the other, unwilling to move. There were have been options all along before the invasion, through the invasion. In fact, as recently as late, late as April, there were negotiations in progress under Turkish auspices between Russia and Ukraine. We don't know much about it because these things don't get reported here. We only discuss war. We don't discuss possibilities for peace. Uh, the, uh, but it is known that uh, the Prime Minister of England, then Boris Johnson, flew to Ukraine, uh, informed Ukrainians, the West, meaning the US and Britain didn't want negotiations. Now, he was followed by Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. We don't have a record of what he said, but it's fair to surmise that he repeated his constant, loud, clear message, official policy, 
uh, the war must continue to weaken Russia severely. Well, anyway, the negotiations uh, were aborted at that point for whatever reason, we don't know. Uh, are there still possibilities? They reduce the longer the war goes on. Uh, are they still there? Only one way to find out, try. Uh, no other way. The basic framework of negotiations has been, diplomacy has been understood for a long time. Question is, uh, will all sides be willing to pursue it? We no, can I ask us. a question to that? No, who yeah. could bring the two sides to the table? Who could be the moderator or countries which can force the two sides to negotiate? Can India, like the Mexican government suggests, play a role? Can China play a role? What is the role of the European Union in this process? Well, the, the role of the negotiations, some negotiations have succeeded under Turkish auspices. The grain negotiations, for example, the, uh, the nuclear site negotiations, that was Turkish auspices. And, uh, the, power station, the, uh, the April negotiations. Uh, China could play a role if it chose to. China's taking the position of almost the entire world. Stay out of it. Uh, I should say that you have to be very careful reading reports here. There's a lot of commentary recently, cited commentary about how uh, Prime Minister Modi of uh, India uh, re, uh, uh, condemned uh, Putin for launching the war and therefore he was withdrawing any willingness to cooperate. Total fabrication. It's, in fact, you can take a look at the Indian government website, which I took the trouble of doing. He said the opposite. Uh, the, Propaganda here is based on six words. He met Putin in Samarkand. He said, we have the transcript. He said, a war is not the way. Those are the words that are repeated here, taken to mean India objects to your invasion. The rest of his talk is practically a love letter to Putin, saying our relations are very close. They will stay even more firm. We, uh, we treasure our uh, close, intimate relations and support you. That part didn't get reported. And in fact, quite generally, the atmosphere here is so extremist that you have to be quite careful in reading what is said and looking at what is not said. No, maybe the last question here, but as you were just indicating, here in the United States, you know, the support for an endless war is is certainly univ almost universal in Congress, uh, and uh, and and Europe is at this point, you know, well behind the United States in, in backing maybe a war to the last Ukrainian. What do you see as ways that uh, ordinary citizens uh, can, at this juncture, uh, try to uh, press to move uh, toward a negotiated end to the war? The United States cannot take an active role in this, but it can remove an impediment to diplomacy. The impediment is our insistence that the war must be continued to weaken Russia. That's a virtual guarantee that it'll continue to escalate, maybe to terminal destruction. So what we can do is move to change that policy to try to bring the United States into conformity with most of the world. Uh, as I said, even three quarters of the population of Germany and saying, let's see if we can get out of this mess without making it even worse. Let's see if there's a way to move towards a diplomatic settlement again. The prospects recede the longer the war goes on. So let's not delay. Let's take any move we can 
in that direction. Uh, instead of right now in the United States, anyone who proposes this, I mean, even a, somebody like Henry, Henry Kissinger gets vilified, demonized, uh, Putin lover, appeasement, Munich, and so on. That's overwhelmingly the world position we should join them. Is there a way of implementing this? Well, one way to find out, try. Stop blocking it, try, see if you can. Maybe there still is. Otherwise, Ukraine is likely to be destroyed and much of the world might go up with it. I should mention one thing that is rarely discussed and it's perhaps the most important aspect of this. Part of the side effect of the Ukraine war is to reverse the limited efforts that have been made to deal with the crisis of global warming. We have a short period in which we can either deal with this crisis or basically go up in flames. That's, that's the fact. And instead of dealing with this crisis during this narrow window, we are extending the crisis. Resources are going into destruction, uh, overuse of fossil fuels, when we should be doing the opposite. Uh, and uh, uh, there's not much time. So now we're in the United States, we're opening up new fields of oil fields for exploitation, uh, indicating a long-term commitment to destruction, destroying ourselves when we should be doing the exact opposite. And as long as the war continues, that's gonna continue until it brings us to a point of no return to tipping irreversible tipping points, which are not far in the distance. It's a suicide pact. No, no, thank you. Among other things, that points to the importance of, of common security diplomacy. Uh, you have recognition not only in relationship to Russia, but in relationship to China and others, you know, that if we don't co cooperate, we're doomed. Even if cooperation can be difficult. Reiner, do you have a last question? No, I want only to say thank you, Noam, for taking your time. And I think your answers are very, very helpful to support the development of the peace movement and the actions of the peace movement, which are absolutely needed now. And I think your arguments are great for the support of these activities. Thank you so much. Noam, let me thank you as well. Uh, we will get this out as widely as we can. And let me just wish you um, uh, longer life uh, and, and ongoing strength. Uh, so you can continue playing the really seminal role that you have for so many years. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. I think we'll, I think we'll, we'll maybe stay on for a little bit 